typically associated with unsexiness, software people, um, and in particular, uh, our role in the world. So I use the word our, yes. Um, so in particular, what I want to talk about today is we're software people and our time is now. How many people in the room identify, you know, feel like you are a software person? Yep, that's what I figured. And there's an interesting reason why, and that's what I want to walk through today. But my story begins actually when I started Twilio. And I went out to go raise the uh, first round, of, you know, our seed round investment and talked to a lot of uh, venture capitalists and got this, uh, you know, this quizzical look when I talked about Twilio, I talked about building a platform for software people to build applications that communicate and using APIs as the means of the go-to-market. And what I got were a lot of uh, VCs who looked at it and they said, well, wait, I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense to me. Why don't you go build an application, build a call center, build a PBX, build something like that, and then and if you're successful and only then, put an API on it and then see what other people can do. Right, that's the only way, right? That's how Facebook did it, right? That's how all the companies we know that have APIs that we talk about have done it, and that's how you should do it. And they were very grumpy about this. They were sort of like very stern, like this is how APIs are done. And this wasn't at all what we had in mind. Right, we talked about it, we're like, eh, maybe we're wrong, maybe we're crazy, but this wasn't at all what we had in mind. In fact, it sort of comes from our own experience, our own backgrounds, and you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur, one of the uh, things that I'd done in the past, I was the first CTO at StubHub, the online ticketing exchange. And we were at StubHub, we had all these needs actually for communications, right? We're trying to move street commerce from the street corner uh, online into the world of software. It turns out we needed communications, right? We needed uh, to communicate to a seller, hey, your ticket just sold, we're sending a courier to pick it up from you in five minutes. We needed to communicate with a courier, hey courier, we need to do this job. We need to communicate to the buyer, hey, the courier is showing up in two minutes, make sure you're ready. We had all these needs. And then we went out to the industry and we, we, we took a look at what was out there. And what we found were all these vendors selling these monolithic black boxes, right? They did one thing, they were a call center, they went IVR, right? They weren't designed essentially as integration, they were designed as a thing that did one thing. And then some, a lot of times they had something like that let you integrate or extend it, but usually it was so complex and esoteric that you needed all sorts of professional services um, or you know, years of time to buy it and to configure it and get it up and running. And we're like, whoa, 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 we're software people. This doesn't make any sense at all to us, right? Monolithic black boxes. I had another experience, one of my other companies, I started a bricks and mortar retailer in Los Angeles. And when we started this retailer, we said, okay, well we need a point of sale system. And we want one that's gonna let us get all sorts of rich data into and out of the system and let us build on top of it analytics and smart buying algorithms and all sorts of crazy stuff. And what did we find when we went out and looked? Black boxes. Right, we found some of the stuff was, uh, you know, Win32 applications that literally, you know, executable, you just launch, and you could do nothing interesting with it. And the other end, we found enterprise systems, you know, the stuff that Home Depot runs, that you could spend millions of dollars to get up and running, and again, enough professional services uh, to buy a small island, and you could get what you wanted. But really, it was nothing that, like, us as software people that was, like, designed for us, designed to be integrated, to be tinkered with, uh, to be a platform. So that was another experience I had. And then I went to Amazon, was a product manager at Amazon Web Services. And the thing that strikes me about my time at Amazon, one of the, one of the most important things that I remember was an all hands meeting with Jeff Bezos. You know, it was all hands, you got, you know, all, it was like you know, 5,000 people in a room. And he did a Q&A actually during the, these all hands and somebody asked him a question. And interestingly enough, I don't even remember what the question was at this point. It was something about are we opening bricks and mortar stores or something, I don't even remember what it was. I'm sure it was a dumb question at the time. But Jeff's answer is what sticks with me. His answer to the question was, we are a software company. In case anybody didn't know that, who worked for Amazon at the time, so we're not a retailer. We're a software company. We happen to make our money because we cause boxes to show up at people's doorsteps. But in our essence, we're a software company. In fact, we make money because we arrange magnetic particles on hard drives better than our competitors. That's what he said, right? What an interesting concept, right, to say, like, we're not a retailer. We arrange magnetic particles on hard drives, but that is the truth about Amazon. And it's interesting, now, you know, 10 years later, you see that fact uh, in all the different lines of business that Amazon is in. They're a software company, right? So who are these software people? What does it mean to be a software person? And there's a hint here. It's not just writing code that makes you a software person. 
In fact, I think of a software person as anyone who sees the world through the lens of software. So this isn't just developers. In fact, there's a wide variety of people inside of a wide variety of companies who are, in fact, software people. Not because you write code, but because you see the world through that lens of software. You look at a problem and you say, how can software solve this problem? That's the fundamental question that software people are constantly asking. And you believe that any problem can be solved once it's brought into the domain of software. Those are sort of the fundamental beliefs of what makes software people, right? So software people are these, pe these people who are solving problems with magnetic particles, like Jeff Bezos said. And the cool thing is that right now is the best time ever to be a software person, primarily for two reasons. Reason number one, more and more of the world's problems are addressable by software people. And reason number two, less and less of non-software problems hinder our progress as software people. So let me explain what these mean. So the first one here, more and more of the world's problems are addressable by software people. What does that mean? Well, let's take a step back and let's think about software and computing generally, right? Software runs and essentially it takes in a part of the world and spits out a part of the world. If computers didn't suck in some part of the real world and then spit something back out into the real world, they would not be useful to us, right? They'd just be boxes that we would wonder what's going on inside of them, right? So that's how all computation works. And you look at the history of this, you look at the history of the world that's being taken into computers and being spit back out into computers. You know, we started with punch cards and teletypes, you know, and then we got more uh, interesting. We added keyboards and laser printers, text input, text output. And then we got even fancier, right? Audio cards, video cards. In fact, you can look at the history of computers, the history of computation as us taking more of the world in and more of the world out and expanding that, what computers are able to do. So what started as solving numerical problems in the 50s and 60s, right? Crunching census data, launching missiles, computing their trajectories, things like that, right? And in the next two decades, the 70s and 80s, we started solving textual problems. We added keyboards, we added laser printers. The computer moved into the office setting, right? A new set of problems we could tackle. Then the next two decades, the 90s and 2000s, multimedia problems because we could suck audio and video into computers and spit it back out. And you got MP3s and YouTube. And now we're in the next phase. Everything else. That's the next two decades. Why, why is this the case? Why is it everything else? Well, let's go back to our, our model here, right? Uh, if you break it out, there's sensors and actuators. So you're sensing a part of the world, bringing it into the computer, and then the computer is actuating something back out into the world. That's the model. That's how it works. And what we're seeing today is a proliferation of the number of sensors and actuators in the world. And this is what's driving this next phase of computation. Why is that? Primarily one reason, that device. This thing is just a bucket of sensors and actuators in our pockets, sensing and actuating on the world, and connected to the internet and programmable at various points. So this thing is drastically increasing the number of sensors and actuators in the world that we can program. Another interesting thing, if you look at Twilio, you can think of this as a programmatic means to control 15 billion devices worldwide. Control their ringers, their vibrators, their microphones, and their speakers. All use, Dave, did you just say vibrators in chat and like giggle? I knew it, I like sensed it. Right, so you can now programmatically control 15 billion sets of sensors and actuators in the world. <laughs> uh, let's look at some other examples, right? How about this, square? Right, this is a little piece of plastic, but what it really is is a sensor. And all it is is the sensor in this equation of sensors and actuators that allows square to do payments, right? It senses your magnetic strip on your card pulls that data into the cloud where it can compute on it, and it actually actuates back out, but instead of the usual way of a receipt printer chugging out a receipt, it uses SMS to actuate that receipt back out into the world. 
Let's look at another example. Uber. Sensors and actuators on this phone allow Uber to tackle the problem of transportation. Right, sensors, where am I? Where are all the other cars? Which ones are available? Compute, have algorithms that determine who to, who to reach, who's available. Actuators, SMS that says, your cab is pulling up now, get in. It's really interesting that the sensors and actuators here allow Uber to move into this industry of transportation. Let's look at another example, Fitbit. How many of you guys have a Fitbit? Right? A lot of people think of Fitbit as a hardware company, because you do literally buy that little thing. But what's so interesting is that little device is the minimal amount of hardware needed in order to bridge the physical world into the world of software. What you are buying when you buy a Fitbit is not the device. It's the output of the device, that dashboard. The device itself is worthless without that dashboard. And so what Fitbit did is they built the minimal amount of sensors and actuators that they needed in a physical world in order to turn that problem of self-measurement into a software problem. So what you see is this interesting thing in company after company, right? Square, think about that tiny little two cent piece of plastic. You get this minimalism. This minimalism of these companies that are bridging the physical world into software because that minimalism of the bridge is what preserves the power of software. Because whatever you bake into hardware, whatever you put into that sensor and actuator is something that you can no longer use the power of software to address. So this is really interesting and you can start to look at the world through this lens of people who are software people addressing the world's problems by sucking more of the world into the world of software. And you start to see the game plan you start to see the business model of all these different companies. Let's take a look, right? How many uh, of you have a remote that looks like that for your cable box? Definitively, this is not what software people do when they build a remote. Why? Because every button on that remote, first of all, who, you know, God knows how it works, but that remote is only gonna do the things that it essentially was built to do at the factory, because there's all those buttons. This is what software people do. A minimal implementation, as few buttons as possible. Why? Because that preserves the power of software. Because that's where all the power of an Apple TV resides. And the Apple TV gets updated all the time. You can't update a remote very easily, but my Apple TV gets updated on like a weekly basis with new features, new functionality, new channels, new things you can do. That's software, people. Let's look at another example. We talked about this one before. But when you're not software people, this is your answer to how to charge your credit card. Right, you have that little device. And th the thing is, that device is only ever going to do what it was designed to do and rolled off an assembly line to do 10 years ago. Right, when you need new functionality, what do you do? You throw that thing away and you buy a new one. That's what not software people do. Software people, however, are like Square. Right, that minimal little piece of plastic that then pulls all the functionality and all the intelligence into the world of software where you can update it constantly. Let's look at another example. Your home thermostat. How many of you guys know how this thing works? I can't figure mine out. I never have been able to, right? Let's look at what software people do. Again, it's that minimal bridge, sensors and actuators into the world of software that, uh, that is what makes this work. How about cars? Your car look like that? This is what a Tesla looks like. That is a rolling piece of software. I'm not joking, you see that dashboard? It's two touch screens. That's all there is to it. Software. Let's look at the most popular cell phone uh, in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2007 when the iPhone came out, right? Then the iPhone came out and Steve Jobs said, you know, we got rid of all the buttons, why? What he said is like, oh, it takes up all the real estate on the phone, but what he's really saying is we're preserving the power of software, only providing a keyboard when software needs it. And if we need to add a, a, an 11th button to the keypad one day, we're gonna be able to do it, right? That's what he was saying. This is the quintessential software people taking over the not software people space. Now that's the consumer space. Let's look at the business space. This is the top of the line Cisco desk phone, right? Look at all those buttons. Lots of buttons on that thing. But you might be saying, Jeff, Cisco, 
how can you say Cisco is not a software company, right? They employ 40,000 software engineers, right? That's more than almost everybody in Silicon Valley combined, right? How can you say they're not a software company? Well, I can say they're not a software company, and I'm going to do my best Jeff Foxworthy impersonation. You might not be a software people when this is how you scale that out. And I'm not making this up. That is from Cisco's website. <laughs> like, that's not a Photoshop. That is real. You guys have seen those. That's how they scale those things out. As software people, we know that the software person implementation of a telephone is just this. A speaker and a microphone. That is the minimal thing that you need to actuate the physical world and to sense the physical world into a voice conversation, right? So that's what I mean when I say this minimal hardware implementation preserves the power of software, right? So more and more of the world's problems are addressable by software people. But the other thing is that less and less of the non-software problems of the world hinder the progress of software people. What do I mean by that? Well, look at this guy. He's pretty smug. He just built a data center. He feels pretty good about himself, right? <laughs> Look at the problems he had to solve in order to build that data center, right? Server, hardware, networking, racks, HVAC, power, real estate. He had to like decide and make a bet on where the real estate market was going in order to decide where to put a data center, right? That is definitively not software. But now us software people, we have the pure software solution to this problem, right? The cloud. You run a software command, run instances, and what do you do? You get a machine, and you didn't have to solve any of those problems. You see a similar thing in, in our business model with Twilio. It used to be that if you were standing up, say, a call center or an IVR or a PBX or an office, right, you had to solve all these different problems. You had to go buy hardware and software and professional services, negotiating carrier contracts. Lawyers, lawyers are not software, for sure, right? So this is not software, and obviously you get the pure software implementation with Twilio. One line of code and the phone rings. That's the goal. That's what you're trying to do. All the non-software problems get out of the way. Right, so we're software people. Our time is now because of these factors, because we're able to address more and more of the world and because the things that got in our way before are diminishing, they're falling away. And what's so cool is that this is a requirement at this point because user expectations have changed. In fact, if you look at the world of consumer and you look at you know, Gmail and your iDevices and Facebook, these are setting the bar of expectation for every consumer and business experience out there. In fact, Forrester Research, Harley Manning has this great quote, the only source of competitive advantage is the one that can survive a technology-fueled disruption, an obsession with customer experience. Creating that customer experience is what matters increasingly because this is the expectation that we have come to, you know, we've come to have because of the great experiences we have with things like Facebook. There's never an upgrade, right? Facebook's never down for maintenance, but our exchange servers constantly are. Sorry, nothing against Microsoft. Um, but what you end up with, what you end up with is this notion going forward that as companies, as solution providers, as technologies to both consumers, SMBs, and enterprises, is that we get no points for using servers. We only get brownie points for serving users. That's the essence of it. And that's what's most important, and that's what software people are so good at. Focusing on the user, because you have to, or else you're in serious risk. That's why software people move incredibly fast, right? What do we do? We iterate quickly. We're shipping constantly. We're getting feedback from customers in these tight loops and making this part of our process. So companies are going to become software people or they are going to lose to software people. And that's a fact. The reason why software people are getting so good at this is because of the internet. Because competition is closer than ever before in most of our businesses. What does that mean? Well, if you don't provide a great customer experience, your competition is literally a click away on Google. So as online business creators, we have had to get really good. Google has trained us to get really good at focusing on the user. 
But it's so interesting, even if you're not an online company and even if you're not a software company, social media is doing this for everyone else too. Why is that? How many of you guys remember the United Breaks Guitars story? Remember United, you know, this guy like looked out the window and he saw the United people uh, breaking his guitar in, in the shipping part and uh, he got really mad, United didn't do anything about it, so he made this viral video saying how United breaks guitars, it's got 12 million hits, a PR disaster for United. But what's so interesting is that United has successfully shipped plenty of guitars in its history, but it only takes one screw up to create a PR nightmare for them. And this is true in every industry. So what's so interesting is that going forward, organizations are going to be measured by the customer experience they create at scale for every single customer because one screw up has huge repercussions. And what's so interesting is that only software people can do this at scale. That's why I believe in software people. I believe software people are going to take over every single industry using these principles because they can take over those industries because we're able to solve those problems but also because when they apply the software mindset to those problems and to those industries, they're going to beat the people who do not think that way. We're software people. We are the army of ones and zeros. We're rebuilding the world through that lens of software, and because of that, we are going to win. Thank you very much. Software people.